Good afternoon, and welcome to Smithsonian Gardens Let's Talk Gardens, a weekly webinar series that we hope to give you information to turn your brown thumb green. As always, we have a terrific program for you today. But before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to give you a few housekeeping tips. Please, we're not going to raise our hands or answer raised hands today in the presentation, but please put your questions in the chat box. After the presentation, we will be calling upon those questions and I'll be giving them to our presenter so that he can answer them to his full ability. Also, for optimal conditions, make sure that all your other browser windows are closed and just have this one open. So you'll have the best viewing conditions, the best video connection possible. And if you are in the DC area, please come down and visit us. Our gardens are open, they're gorgeous, and the fall colors are really starting to shine. So I invite you to come down and visit. No time tickets, nothing to get in your way. Just come on down and share the beauty with us. We'd love to see you in our gardens. So for today's presentation, very timely in the Mid-Atlantic area, we just looked at the weather and it's gonna be colder, much colder this weekend. So you need to start thinking about bringing in your tropicals if you haven't already. And today's presenter, Matt Fleming, is our tropical uh, specialist at the greenhouse in Suitland. So Matt, how are you? Great, thanks for uh, having me and everyone for joining the talk today. Well, terrific. Well, we're gonna find out a little bit about our audience to help you out uh, during your presentation because you and I were talking and we're trying to find out what plants I should bring in, what plants you're gonna bring in. So I was gonna go ahead and share a poll with our audience and find out first, what do you consider tropical? What zone do you live in here in the Mid-Atlantic area? or a strong zone seven, maybe even sometimes going into a zone eight. And then we wanna know what you're bringing in. So I just placed it up on the screen. If you would please go ahead and vote, we'd really enjoy hearing from you and to see where you're from and then what you're gonna be bringing in. And that will help out Matt because he has to think about Bringing, advising people, the staff downtown, to bring all their containers in, as well as dig some of their favorite tropicals that they overwinter then in the greenhouse. Oh, Matt, do you see this? It looks like most of our <laughs> visitors are from Zone 7, so they're- That's great. In the Atlantic area, so you'll know all about that. A couple of zones. Yeah, and mostly containers so far, uh, but they do have a mix of tropicals that they are bringing in. So that's pretty cool. Uh, we have, I'm gonna leave this up just for a couple more seconds, but then I'll share it with our audience so that they can see what's out there. We do have some people in zone 10 and zone nine. So there are some warmer areas that work with, so they might be able to leave everything outside. Uh, let's find out what their information is. So I'm gonna end the poll and share the results with our public. And say 68% is from zone seven and 81% are looking to bring their containers uh, in that have tropicals inside them. So I am going to disappear and leave it up to you. Please tell us more about yourself and your experience and jump right into today's program. Thank you, Matt. All right, well, thank you, Cindy. And uh, thanks for everyone for joining us today. I hope that um, you get something out of it and if we do have any technical difficulties, bear with us, but uh, knock on wood, hopefully we should all be well. So we are going to talk about bringing in your tropical plants. Basically, it is going to be overwintering. And in the simplest form, overwintering is the art of not killing things over the winter. And that's basically my job. So, couple things about me. I have worked at Smithsonian Gardens for almost 11 years now. 10 of those which have been in the tropical department. So I've learned a lot 
uh, made some mistakes and hope to share some of those things with you all today. Uh, I hate to weed. Uh, it is part of life if you work with plants. It's just something I don't like to do. Overall, I'm not that good at pronouncing, pronouncing genus and species names, so be mindful of that when you're talking with friends and everyone that we all make mistakes. And yes, I have certainly killed plants before, a lot of plants, and even this awesome one pictured here. Um, luckily, it was um, not too far gone where I was able to take a couple cuttings and we have uh two pieces that are now probably four years old that are i don't know every bit of a, a foot a foot and a half tall so while the mother has uh since gone we have her baby still alive um so i'm assuming most of you over winter tropical plants uh popular choices include hibiscus various tropical vines passifloras mandevillas some succulents, bergmansias, bananas are another popular one. Then you have your bulbs, tubers, rhizomes, your cannas, your colocasia, dahlias, things like that. Palm trees, majesty palms, arecas, and then also uh, herbs and vegetables as well, like rosemary or even pepper plants. Uh, so the first thing we got to do is we got to decide what to keep. And I don't really like to think of it as what are we keeping, but more why are we keeping it? One of, you know, the things to consider is maybe it has sentimental value to you. Uh, it was your mom's, your grandmother's, something like that, and it has a special place in your heart. So, you know, no matter the circumstances, that's getting saved. Uh, my wife and I gave out uh, African violets as wedding gifts for uh, our wedding, and um, I'm obviously not getting rid of that because I want to stay married. And um, just, you know, if it's important to you and you want to keep it, go ahead. It also could be a rare species or cultivar. It may have taken you a long time to acquire and um, if you were to get rid of it over the winter, then it's possible that you wouldn't be able to find it again. Uh, just remember cultivars come and go. It can be both a good thing and a bad thing. It's good because certainly um, new and improved things can come out, lots of new things to try. Uh, it's bad in the sense that maybe you had a hibiscus that you just loved and you know it finally finally came by the wayside after a long time, you went to go buy another one and it's not being offered anymore. So uh, something to think about. Finally, maybe it's a large specimen that is gonna be hard to replace. Maybe you have a you know, 30 or 40 year old jade plant that you know, you're not just gonna um, be able to find another one uh, at a local garden center. So um, don't wanna throw that away. Uh, two pictures I ha have on here. The left one is just a picture of kind of how uh, I try to utilize all the space that we have in the greenhouse. We have a couple big philodendrons, so I stack them up on pallets, and then we put the ferns underneath because they don't mind the shade, but with the philodendrons raised, it uh, just allows us to have a little more space. Uh, on the right is probably a 20 foot tall triangle palm. Brings us back to, you know, a large specimen. We're not just gonna go to Home Depot and get another one of those come spring. So that's obviously something that we're gonna keep from year to year. Um, so seriously though, go crazy. What, what do you have to lose? It, it, it is a tropical and if it's gonna die, um, you know, or you're gonna throw it away, why not give it a try? Uh, you can do things like whack the root ball back, you can chop the top back, um, you know, do, do whatever you can to make it work for you in your situation. Uh, plants want to do two things, live and reproduce. Uh, they're certainly going to help you win, but it's also okay if you lose as well. And um, 
the last thing to, to kind of remember is it, it doesn't have to look that pretty over the winter. And um, if a friend comes over and you're really worried about it, hide it for a couple of days. Uh, it will be as awesome as you remember it come May and, that, and that's all that matters. As long as it's alive over the winter, that's our goal. Of course, there's gonna be a lot of limiting factors on what you can and can't keep. Uh, one of the main, probably the most important thing is space. Um, do you have a greenhouse in your backyard? Sure, then, you know, fill it up and, and keep whatever you can. Uh, maybe you have a two bedroom apartment where your couch takes up half of your living room, then you're not gonna be able to keep as much and you have to take that into consideration. Uh, time, your time. Do you work 10 hours a day in you know gardening or construction and you just wanna go home and relax? Maybe you're retired and you have all, all day to, you know, take care of things. Uh, another thing to think about is how long are you willing to spend watering and performing other chores as needed every week? Um, then the plant needs. Is it a high or low maintenance plant? Um, is it something that you're gonna have to cut back, a vigorous vine, uh, or is it just a succulent that is gonna be slow growing and not gonna need much attention? Obviously the big thing is how much water is it gonna need? Is something you have to water every day. Maybe it's going to go dormant and you don't have to worry about it. Uh, and then finally cost. And the cost is going to be if you want to replace it come spring. Uh, maybe it's a large specimen like we kind of spoke about. And uh, if you were to try to find one, it would be an arm and a leg to replace. So what do we do before they come in? Uh, scouting, one of the most important things that you can do. Uh, you should obviously be doing that anyway. Uh, pests, a lot of different ways you can take care of things. You can simply squash them, like if they're aphids or mealybug, things like that. You can cut off part of the plant that's infected, uh, or you could spray it with a simple soap and oil to, if you have a little bit of a higher population, to knock it back. Just remember though, a small outbreak outside is gonna equal craziness inside, where outside you have birds, other insects kind of helping you. Um, inside, you're not gonna have any of those friends. So populations are gonna, gonna go um, much higher and much quicker as well. Uh, if it does have a disease, nine times out of 10, in my opinion, you should just trash it. Um, don't put it in the compost pile though, because what you don't want to do is um, have it over winter. Then come spring, you're spreading out your compost and you're giving everyone a little phytophthora, a little, little pythium for you, whatever the case. Um, so uh, just trash it. Diseases, they're just not worth the risk and the hassle. Uh, risk as in spreading to other plants that you may have, hassle as in they are not the easiest to uh, get under control. A lot of times you have to spray, you know, two, three times and um, back to back, as well as clean up any of the affected leaves. So uh, if it has a disease and it's not, you know, something that you can't live without, just get rid of it. Uh, fertilizer. Basically, we just want to make sure that we have enough so our plants aren't starving. Uh, we don't want them to be pushing growth, but you also do want to start with a healthy plant for the long winter ahead. One thing you can do is to move plants to a semi-shady location uh, just to get a start on acclimating them to the lower light levels that they are going to be uh, getting all winter long indoors. So make life easier on yourself, you know, if you can, Cut back uh, any vines or woodies that um, do respond well to pruning, which is honestly most of them. Uh, it'll save space and water needs at least for a little while. And anything that can go dormant, uh, let it go dormant. The ones that most of us know, you have your cannas, your caladiums, colocaceous, uh, other tubes and uh, bulbs and tubers, 
some that you may or may not know, bananas, plumerias, and pepper plants. So the picture here is just of uh, Akalefa that we have. Um, the one on the right is how it was sent back to me. The one on the left is um, I cut it back and uh, I did the right one as well after taking this picture. Uh, this is actually a picture I took literally like last week. Uh, one of the gardens sent back a bunch of their hibiscus and um, the left picture is how I received it. Uh, roots all a mess, you know, the top kind of grown out. So what I did is I cut back probably 10, 12 inches all around the plant and uh, didn't do too much to the roots because um, it had a, uh, a decent root system on it and um, potted it up and that's what it's gonna look like over the winter. So let's talk a little bit about dormancy. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people from different areas on here. From the poll, it does seem that most of you are kind of in that DMV zone seven area. So uh, it, it's gonna be very both plant and location specific, but uh, you know, here are some generalities to to factor and kind of think on. You should probably stop fertilizing about four weeks before the first frost and um, or whatever you plan on bringing that plant in. You, uh, again, you don't want to be feeding the heck out of them so they're growing like crazy once you bring them in. Obviously, you want to bring it in at the appropriate time, cold sensitivity for the plant. We have some plants that uh, you know, can stay out till Thanksgiving. We have other plants that it gets below 55, 50 degrees, and it's going to show you um, that it's mad and it will have some cold damage. So all going to depend on the plant. Um, is it going to go completely dormant? Is it a bulb, a rhizome, something similar? Or is it more, as I just like to say, you know, is it going to chill and relax over the winter? like a lantana or plumeria, things like that. The key really is to keep the plants in a cool, dark place. Uh, when I say cool, about 50 degrees, give or take, uh, a basement, uh, garage, crawl space, things like that uh, often work well. Some things do need to be watered from time to time where others need no water at all. So we're gonna talk about couple specific things, or a couple specific plants and um, anything special that may pertain to them. You'll notice some things are kind of repetitive, but uh, we'll just talk about uh, those quickly. So your cannas, caladiums, your dahlias, um, things that have a, a rhizome or a tuber, they, they're gonna go into basically what I call full dormancy. So what you should do with those, in most cases, you wanna let a light frost hit them, then dig them up, set them somewhere to dry out for a few days, preferably somewhere with a little bit of shade, but you do want good air movement around them. Cut back the foliage to just a couple inches, then brush as much of the soil off as possible. You can store them in dry peat moss, sawdust, wrap them in newspaper, and store them in a cool, dark place. You're gonna hear me say cool, dark place a lot uh, with dormant plants, because that, that is important. Uh, remember though, it certainly is a good idea to check on them occasionally. Uh, specifically check on any of, any of them are rotting, you wanna remove them. The saying that one bad apple can spoil the whole, spoil the whole bunch is so true with um, bulbs and tubers and things like that. Um, so when you check them, you just want to give them a squeeze. And if there's any, any soft spots or anything like that, most likely you just want to toss it. And depending on your situation, you can pot them up um, and start bringing them out of dormancy about four to six weeks before the last frost in the spring to get a jump start on larger plants. Uh, so Plumeria and Brugmansia, uh, I consider them kind of more semi-dormant. You can cut them back, especially the Brugmansia. They respond so well to a hard pruning. Uh, Plumeria do as well, 
but you're going to have about four or five shoots from any pruning that you have. So you may want to go in and thin, thin those out when they start to break bud. Again, keep it into a cool, dark place. They both will uh, likely lose their leaves. And watering wise, again, it's going to depend on how hard you cut it back, how big of a pot, things like that. But about two to four weeks, depending on your situation. One nice thing about plumeria, they have uh, a real fleshy, thick stem and you can, you can squeeze them. And if they start to feel mushy, you want to water them. We want a nice, uh, hard, turgid stem. Banana is a very popular one. So if they're in the ground, you want to dig them up, cut back the top to a more manageable size, uh, clean off some soil around the roots. Ideally, you want to probably store it sideways uh, in a basement crawl space something similar. Um, you can keep it in a pot as well, cut it back, store it in a cold dark place again, probably water it about once a month or so so the soil doesn't pull too far for what, away from the edge of the pot. Uh, I have had some times where you cut it back to like a foot let's say in the top few inches because there's so much water in the banana. Uh, it starts to rot the growing point. So just be careful of that. And uh, it's another reason why it's important to keep it in a cool, dark place. Um, but just something I had, have noticed and ran into time and time again. Um, if it does happen, a lot of times, if you just cut right bef below uh, the rotted part, it will flush. Um, sorry about that. It will flush uh, new growth and be fine. Uh, peppers, lantana, and some similar plants like that. Um, again, they're going to kind of go semi-dormant. If it was in the ground, dig it up, throw it in a pot, cut it back. They all respond great to pruning. Keep it in a cool, dark place. They'll likely lose their leaves. Again, water every two to four weeks, depending on your situation. Uh, you don't want the soil to completely dry out, though. Herbs, uh, rosemaries, and oregano, things like that. Um, if it was in the ground, dig it up and repot. Obviously, they respond well to being cut back because, well, we cut them when we use them when we're cooking. And you can enjoy uh, herbs over the winter. There are some things like rosemary, for example, that uh, can't be overwintered in the ground. So in Cooler locations, it will need to be brought inside, and that too can kind of be kept semi-dormant over the winter, like a lantana or a pepper plant. Uh, things that don't go dormant, but you just want to keep. Um, maybe it's palms, hibiscus, vines, things like that. Uh, if it was in the ground, dig it up and repot. Move it to a semi-shady location. Uh, again, to get it acclimated to the lower light levels, uh, a week or two is fine. You don't need to go too crazy. Uh, I'm big on whacking things back. I've mentioned it a couple times, both the shoots and the roots as needed. And again, it's going to come down to your situation and what your needs are and your space and things like that. So um, in, if you have a plant that is going crazy, maybe it's a vine, just whack it back again if it's getting too big for you. Or you can simply start over. Uh, collect seeds and replant. A lot of the vines come up very easily from seed and they tend to grow fast. Take cuttings and start fresh. Um, before you take cuttings and get rid of something, you might want to see how, how well the cuttings take before getting rid of something. Um, if you take a dozen cuttings and none of them take and you already threw away the, the plant, you're certainly not gonna be too happy. So um, maybe keep it for a year and make sure the cuttings take. If you take a dozen and 10 stick, then next year you could probably be safe in throwing it away. A lot of plants can be divided, sins of area, things like that. Um, easy way to save on space, give some to your friends, neighbors, things like that. Just a note to remember, some plants 
do need time to heal over so they don't rot before repotting. Uh, Sansevieria especially, um, you want to heal over. So what to do with them over the winter? Uh, obviously you want to water at proper times. Each plant is going to be different. Both um, or plants that are the same but maybe are in different containers are going to have different water needs. Scout and manage any pest or uh, disease issues. Uh, to feed or not to feed them. In most cases, I, I lean towards no fertilizer over the winter. Uh, if you see an obvious issue, you can certainly address it, but um, you, you just don't want them pushing growth in inside. It's going to be weak, leggy, and, and uh, just not, not something you want to try to push. Uh, rotate your plants. Uh, we don't want any leaning tower of hibiscuses. I would say, you know, get on a good habit of rotating them once a week. And um, finally, we want to water at the proper times. Oh, wait, we already talked about that, didn't we? Yes, we did, because that's probably the most important thing that you can do over the winter um, is, is watering at the proper time. You don't want to underwater, you don't want to overwater. So spring is coming. Uh, what you can do is start bringing plants in pots um, that were dormant, um, that maybe aren't getting planted directly in your garden um, out of dormancy. Just remember that less water is better. Rot is going to be your biggest enemy for the first month or more. Things that like you cut back maybe or that um, respond well to a good cutback, cut them back again. Hibiscus, Brugmansia, things like that. Uh, winter growth growth is often very weak and leggy, so if you were to put it outside, get a decent windstorm, a lot of those branches are going to um, snap on you. So give them a good pruning. Uh, timing is, is going to be very dependent on your needs and the growth of the plant as well. Uh, once outside and, and acclimated, you can start to feed, but don't go too crazy in the beginning. You have all season. You don't want to burn any of the new roots. So we'll talk briefly about timing. Uh, take this with a grain of salt. This is basically for me in the D.C., Maryland, Virginia area in a greenhouse for gardens that need to be perfect come uh, May. So usually I'll stop feeding in November. I may feed once a month from November, uh, December, January. And then when the days start to get a little bit longer, I'll go to every other week in February at about a half of half the normal rate. And for us, we don't keep any bulbs or tubers uh, in um, like a box or a bag or something like that. We, what we do is we pot them up now, basically water them once, then we won't water them again until basically the last week of February. And I'll go through and soak everything really heavily. And then I won't do anything again for two weeks. And then I will water them again. And if the soil has really started pulling away from the outside of the pot, I'll kind of go through and rough up all the edges so the water isn't just running right off before I water them again that second time. And then I won't water them again uh, until the plant tells me it's time. And what I mean by that is um, after that second watering, you know, a week, two weeks, maybe more, um, hopefully they're, the bulbs are going to start waking up. The caladiums are going to start pushing growth. We have a lot of amorphophallus, things like that. And um, if you keep watering them, they're just going to rot. And even if you do see them pushing growth, um, dig to the side a little bit and check because, you know, an inch under the top dry level of soil, um, it could be wet. And those bulbs and tubers obviously had little to no roots all winter. So, um, Overwatering is, is your biggest enemy at that point. Uh, just a, a couple things that I cut back. We 
cut back a ton of stuff, but these are just some examples I pulled at different times. Uh, hibiscus, I cut back in mid-February. They seem to be a little bit slower, especially after a hard pruning. It takes them a while to break bud again. Uh, we have a lot of cane begonias. I'll cut that them back to just a couple nodes in mid-March. Uh, shrimp plants in early April. The acolypha that I showed a picture of a lot earlier, uh, I cut them back in mid-April. And acclimation is all going to be temperature and plant. Um, dependent and it, it can vary from from year to year but I would say you know mid-April is when I try to start bringing things outside and getting them accl acclimated. This is just a picture of uh, Euphorbia continifolia. The picture on the left was taken right before the one on the right. Basically I, I cut it back really hard and um, it will, it'll flush growth again and then start to look great come the warmer weather. These are two different species of Tipicina. The um, one on the left we kind of made into a standard. The one on the right is just a bush form. Again, all that winter growth is gonna be weak and leggy, so you wanna get that out of there. Uh, a great time to put plants outside, depending on the weather, is right after a hard pruning. Uh, they won't need to um, acclimate to full sun. So that picture of the euphorbia, it's a little bit more cold hardy. So basically, as soon as I cut it back, I'll, I'll throw it right outside in full sun so the new leaves can be acclimated as they come out. Just saves on, on time and in effort of moving them around and finding shade for them. So acclimating your plants when they do go back outside, uh, this is something we're all guilty of. I I've done it many a times. Uh, sunburn can certainly be the biggest issue, cold obviously. Uh, one thing not to forget is wind. You know, it may be let's say 48 degrees, but if you got 10, 12 mile an hour winds all day, constant, uh, it, it's going to be a lot colder to those plants, uh, especially any new and tender growth. It, they'll be a lot more susceptible to cold and or wind damage. You certainly don't want to set them right outside in full sun after they've been indoors all, all winter. If you can, put them somewhere where they're going to get a little bit of shade. If you can't, bring them out for a few hours at a time every day slowly working up to all day. It's better to start maybe late morning as opposed to, you know, two or three o'clock in the afternoon when the, the sun is at its, you know, strongest. And if you don't have any place to put them under shade or anything like that, you can certainly bring them out in any overcast or rainy days. Uh, lastly, uh, just to kind of finish up on a few points, uh, most of us here are probably all plant dorks and we hate to trash a perfectly good plant, but there are times when we just don't have any other choices. Again, cutting, seed, those are good alternatives. Uh, and you're going to kill some things from time to time and that's all right. That That's part of being a gardener. And honestly, if you're not killing anything, are you really trying? Um, it's, it's, it's part of just that, you know, the business and or the, the passion that we have. Try new things. If you kill something, it gives you more space to try something else. Just remember, new doesn't always mean better. Just, you know, as an example, it seems while it's not a tropical, it seems that there are, you know, 50 new echinacea cultivars that come out every year. And just because it's new doesn't always mean it's better. Push the limits of your zone. If, if, you know, if you don't have room for it and it dies, again, so what? What's the, what's the, the harm? Uh, not in, all winters are created equal. And what I mean by that is, uh, I think it was maybe two or three years ago, we had a, a really um, cold, cold winter. And then I believe last winter, it was very mild. And we had a lot of things in some of the gardens downtown not even die back that, that normally do die back. So, you know, 
if, if you keep something out, it's possible that it may live for a couple years, then we have a really cold winter and it may die, but at least you got to enjoy it while you could. One last thing, remember if you're keeping anything dormant or semi-dormant, the, the key really is to keep plants in the dark and keep them chilly. It just kind of helps them stay dormant and not want to push growth. So that is all I have. I did want to say thank you to everyone that joined us today and to Cindy for putting this on. Uh, I hope everyone has enjoyed all the talks and especially this one. So thank you. Thank you, Matt. If you'd stop sharing your screen, they can see uh, your face a little bit better. And we, having, we're, we are having a little bit of sound uh, problems with your uh, microphone. So just stay close to the mic uh, and just make sure that it, your mic is actually on your shirt on your on here. So just make sure it's unencumbered and that will help out. But you are not done because there are a lot of questions that people want to know about. So I want everybody to know that we may not get a chance to ask your specific question, but Matt will do his best to answer the questions afterwards and we'll post them up on our website. But most importantly, for specific questions about uh, pests that you may have, I would look at your extension agents or your extension office uh, handouts or, or, or on their website uh, because your pests have different stages like scale you can't take care of uh, unless it's in a specific stage and some of the other things so look to see inform yourself first but the one thing that people really want to know what is the right watering routine how do you tell if they if you need to keep it watered or not um, um. As in dormant plants or just watering it over the winter in general? I think just watering in the winter over general, but also hit upon the dormant plants. So that, that is probably one of the most asked questions I get is when do I water or how, how often should I water? And it's probably also one of the hardest questions to answer. Um, mm -hmm. Let's say that you have a 20 foot tall palm tree in a 12 inch pot, probably not realistic, but it's gonna be all roots and you probably couldn't give that thing enough water. Whereas if you had a newly sprouted seedling where it barely has even true leaves and it's cotyledons and you put it in a four foot pot, you're probably not gonna to have to water it again before, it's di before it dies. So <laughs> the, the biggest thing about watering is get to know your plants. And what I mean by that is as you kind of check on them every day, you'll start to get a good understanding of how fast they do dry out. And the, the two things that I do besides taking into consideration what plant it is, is it a succulent? Is it something that grows in you know sandy soils or it needs a lot of water? Um, is you know your finger, stick your finger in, in the soil the top couple inches are dry, most likely needs water. Uh, you can also lift, lift them up if they're not too, too heavy. Uh, dry soil weighs a lot less than, than heavy wet soil. So um, those are two things, but also use your eyes. If the soil, you know, looks dry to you and is pulling away, it's definitely time to water. <laughs> but again, a lot of times the top layer of soil inch or so can can be dry but beneath it can be wet so i know that wasn't a specific answer but it, it just varies too much depending on the plant and mm -hmm. container size that it's in you know uh, especially with bringing tropicals in if you whack it back cut the roots back a little bit it's not going to need a lot of water for you know maybe a month maybe more and um if it's wilted, it may not need water. It just may be that the plant is, you know, suffering right now from getting mutilated by cutting back mm -hmm. everything. So again, don't just water based on its, its wilting. It, it may not be that, that the soil is dry. It just can't take up enough water um, because again, you cut back a lot of its roots, so. Mm -hmm. You gave a really perfect uh, example of what you do at the greenhouse, because I want everybody to understand 
we had the gardens downtown in DC around all the different museums. And then we had the greenhouse, which is the support center for all those plants. The greenhouse grows most of the annuals uh, that you see down in the gardens downtown. And the greenhouse also supports all the tropical plants over the winter. So you can imagine how many plants Matt has to water uh, over the winter and getting ready. So lifting up the pot, is a really good suggestion because you can't stick your finger in each one of them. So lifting up a pot as you go down is, is really a helpful hint and one that I think more people should take advantage of. And I'm sure that's what you do with the greenhouse uh, and all your support of the tropical plants from downtown. Yeah, and, and you know, Cindy brought up a good point. We have three greenhouses chucked full. There are some things, so yes, we have three greenhouses chucked full of plants. There are things that I water every single day. We have some, tree ferns that once they dry out, they're, they're gonna show you they're mad. So I water them every day, 365. There are some things that get watered maybe once a week. Then we have other things that the dormant or semi-dormant plants that may not get watered for months. Right. And it, it, it all depends. And the more you grow and become familiar with your plants, you're gonna know, you know their needs as well. Mm -hmm. Now, one group of plants you didn't uh, talk about uh, overwintering are citrus plants. So I'm wondering if you have any special tips for citrus. I know I have a lemon tree that you guys grew uh, from seed for one of our programs, Garbage to Gardens, and, yes, yes. and, and, and it's now a big lemon tree. So what do I need to do specifically for that? Um, so we have a, a couple of citrus that we overwinter. We don't have the lemon anymore. Um, just because uh, for display purposes, anytime a lemon would, would fruit, uh, it would somehow magically get stolen. Mm -hmm. And lemons don't look that great without fruit, so we, we uh, ended up getting rid of it. But um, citrus are, aren't, aren't much different than anything else. You, you can certainly cut it back as always, but um, you know, biggest thing would just be to water it at the right time. It's, it's, it's not going to do a whole lot. It's obviously a pretty tropical plant. So over the winter, the days, days are shorter. It's going to be cooler. Um, basically, you just want to keep it alive over the winter. Kind of like I was saying, it may not look that great. Um, if you give it as much light as you can. The more light, the better. But um, nothing too special, I would say, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. I think the only special thing that I do for citrus, but this could be for any plant, is... Uh, when you bring it in, you might not, you might have treated it for pests, whatever, so you don't have a large problem. But all of a sudden you have an explosion again, say in February. And that's usually because that buildup has been occurring all along and you don't notice it too, you have a, a big amount. So for most of my plants, I'll put them in my shower maybe once a month or so and individually, so I can really pay attention to them. I do, I do this, it's, it's a, a, a loving uh, situation for them. And I, and I give them a shower. So I hose off all those mealybugs, I hose off all the uh, flies, all the white flies, whatever is the problem. And you're right, it doesn't look perfect, but it gives them an opportunity to not have this outburst all the time. So right. you do it because you can overhead water really easily in the greenhouse. I can't do that in my living room. Very so true. that's a hint I've picked up through the years is give them a shower, uh, play some opera. They might appreciate all the attention uh, to go along with it. So, and, and somebody asked, how do I uh, keep the ants out of my home when I bring in my pot? So that's I know what a, I do, what do you do? So that's a good question. Um, unfortunately, ants are not the only thing that I deal with. Um, we get mice sometimes in the drainage holes and they'll make a nest. And like that first couple of times that I'll, I'll water, you'll see mice just running everywhere. Um, and uh, it's, it's going to depend on your situation. If it's a small plant, ideally, if it was in a pot, you, I'd take it out and check the roots and before I brought it in, because mm -hmm. if you bring them in, it's, it's going to be a lot harder to, to get rid of. So but there's a lot of products, dusts and drenches that one or two applications can take care of it. Um, but uh, I would say the biggest thing would be to check them before you bring them in. I agree, because I don't get ants, I get pill bugs, which really entertains my cats, but um, it's not great for <laughs> rats. Oh, and somebody said, thank you for warning them about mice. That's true. <laughs> yeah. um, mice do come in sometimes. So, hate the greenhouse if you 
that's how, if you have a greenhouse, and I'm sure most of us are lusting after the greenhouses. If you saw the wonderful greenhouses that Matt works in, you would be lusting too. But do you have to keep those greenhouses heated in the wintertime to keep the tropicals alive? It, again, it's going to depend on what, what you're keeping. Um, if, if all you're doing is just trying to kind of keep things alive over the winter and you're not worried about how they look, again, you can force a lot of things into dormancy that you wouldn't think of. Like, you know, plumeria obviously doesn't go dormant in Hawaii, but here we force it into dormancy by cutting back on watering. It drops all its leaves. It helps me space wise and as well um, pest wise. So mm -hmm. you can kind of force things into dormancy, keeping it a lot cooler. But if you have, you know, palm trees and, and things like that, that, you know, a lot of palms are a lot more cold sensitive than, than you may realize. So it's going to depend on what you want to keep. And the temperature more at night is going to be the most important factor. So right. uh, it, it's, again, it's hard to answer without, it's going to be dependent on what you, what you want to keep. Yeah, uh, and what I'm zone you're in. Right. Yeah, and I think just the main thing is don't let it freeze. So don't actually don't let it get below about 45 degrees. So that that's an important thing because if they're dormant, 45 degrees is still the temperature that you want to get the lowest at. And um, of course, if it's it's alive, it'd be much warmer. So that's a good tip. Um, why? Here's some banana questions. Why do you yeah. store the bananas sideways? I don't know why it's done. I guess to me, it's just to help it. It's, for me, it just helps them think that it's kind of dormant time, that, you know, they're cold, they're in a, a, a cool location. I, I, I'm not going to lie. I don't know why. I've just always been told that. So it's, you were told to do it. So that's what yeah. you do. Actually, I know I do a lot of mine. And, and the reason that I turn mine sideways is to remember not to water them. And also to, it keeps the roots a lot drier. And if something's in the greenhouse and somebody sees it laying lengthwise, um, they don't want to water it. So that's, I think that's the most important thing. So just remember to keep uh, things that are dormant, not watered as well as you would if you're trying to keep them alive. So uh, the other thing that they had a question about, and this is something I've learned as an outdoor gardener, because I'm more of an outdoor horticulturist than a tropical, but I have learned that the, the question was, how do they overwinter some of their tropicals outside? And this is a real key thing is because for our temperatures in zone seven, a lot of plants would survive outdoors if you have them planted so that they drain really well and they don't get too wet in the winter time. So for your bananas, somebody who's putting mulch bags over top of them, that's fine. Do you find the same thing that if it, if it stays drier, it seems to uh, live longer in the garden? Yeah, so that's a, that's a good question. And, and, it, and bananas, and there's a lot of things, cannas, things like that you can do it with. Um, Wet feet is probably one of the biggest things for any any plant that you're trying to, you know, that's marginally hardy as it is. You don't want to keep it wet because then it's not going to have um, a strong root system. So, uh, but yeah, there are certainly things you can do. Dig them up, put them against um, the wall of your house to kind of radiate heat, put leaves, mulch over them, different things like that. But um I've said it a lot. It just depends on where you live, the zone, the plant, things like that. But as a generality, certainly um, the wet, the wet feet is a good, is a good tip. Mm -hmm. it, it really is. It really does make a difference. So if you have something that's marginally hardy, uh, putting it in well-drained soil that maybe you've um, uh, added some uh, grit or some uh, heavy sand, not, not the fine sand, but the multi-particle multi size sand, that seems to help quite a bit. And to, and to keep it drier by maybe putting a little uh, cover on top of it to be able to keep it a little bit drier. Sure. So yeah, people go to great lengths. Uh, yeah, to I mean, I've seen people wise. put chicken wire around 
um, mm -hmm. even like some Japanese maples that are a little bit more cold scent and just fill it with leaves over the winter just to give it a couple degrees. So, you know, certainly get creative and do whatever you can to keep your babies. Yep. The strangest thing I've ever seen, but it worked, was to wrap uh, uh, cactuses outside or some of the succulents outside, wrap them in plastic and put Christmas lights inside of it. Because the heat from the old fashioned Christmas lights, not the LEDs, they don't do the same thing, but the old fashioned Christmas lights will give it enough heat to keep it alive. And somebody just asked that, what is the best way to overwinter cactus on a covered porch? So those of you that have visited Smithsonian Gardens, if you see a gentleman around the hopped garden, Michael is is notorious for doing the the Christmas light trick. There are a couple um, agave and other things that, again, they're kind of marginally hardy. And he's been known to come in on a Saturday afternoon. He puts plastic around it and he'll put the Christmas lights underneath it just to give it, you know, if it's supposed to be in the teens or something like that, he'll 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 do that trick and and it does help it. Mm -hmm. A lot of times it's a couple degrees can make a big difference. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, again, do, do whatever you can to, to make it work. <laughs> and so the person that asked about the cactuses, I would say try one outside on your porch, not all of them, and see what it does. Uh, because it, it just depends on how low your temperatures get and how, how protected your porch uh, is. Uh, this is another good one. What's the best type of pot? to use to overwinter your plants, if you're trying to keep them alive, not dormant? I mean, the only thing, so there's a couple ways you can look at it. If it was in the ground, just throw it in a cheap nursery pot that, you know, you, you would get an azalea in at a garden center. If, if it was in a, you know, a nice fancy terracotta or glazed pot, as long as it has drainage holes in it, you're, you're going to be fine. Um, the biggest thing is just make sure it has drainage holes and um, a good well-drained mix, to be honest with you. There's, there's not much difference between containers in all reality. Just find one that fits the size of your plant and, and is appropriate for, you know, you don't want it too big or too small. So um, I think that's the best key. Fit the size, not necessarily the material, but the size. Uh, to your plant. I always find that I overwater. So for me, terracotta is best because it dries out a little bit quicker. It does. But many of us underwater. So maybe yeah. plastic would work better for you. I or if it. you have a, a fancy container, I'm going to call it, that doesn't have drainage holes in it, you could keep it in a nursery pot and then just slip it in and out too. Um, so there's the thought because yep. you don't want to bring in anything without drainage holes over the winter or you're going to have wet feet and problems. Yeah, because somebody said, how do you lift your heavy plants to put them in the shower? So that's what I do. I keep them in the ugly nursery pots and then slip them into the fancy pots inside so it's not quite as heavy. Uh, I know I'm going to have to stop doing this eventually, but maybe I'll build a shower on the deck. I don't know. Maybe that'll get me. So outdoor can, shower, like at the beach. Outdoor shower, exactly. Um, yeah, everything is on the deck. That's what I do. A lot of my things uh, go out on my deck. This is a good tip, though, because we're both from Zone 7, Zone 8. Uh, so uh, Bob wrote to us that there are those of us who are in the arid or semi-arid areas. Too dry for many plants with sustained freezing temps can also be deadly for plants that can otherwise be overwintered outdoors. And that is very true. In fact, I found that there are people in Massachusetts that can keep things alive in the winter because they have a deep layer of snow where we don't. So our temperatures fluctuate too much uh, in the winter time. So that tip is a very good tip. Consider everything. You really sometimes have to be a detective when you're trying to overwinter your plants. Sure. Um, yeah. Now, wait a minute, there was a couple other ones I really wanted to ask you about. There's, There's a good uh, one that someone wrote about, for those of us that, that may not have a basement um, to store your bulbs and tubers and rhizomes in. Um, it's going to depend on what you, what you have and what you don't have, but uh, a garage is certainly an option if you don't have a garage simply a closet in maybe a cooler area of the house mm -hmm. and um, trying to think of, of other things, but we have a volunteer. Just because it's not super 
cool or dark doesn't mean you can't overwinter, um, but you just have to watch them a little bit more, especially the rotting. And, mm -hmm. um, um, but yeah, go for it. Again, if it's not going to make it either way, try a couple different spots in your house and see what works out the best and see, you know, see what works. Right. We have a volunteer that has a guest room that she keeps the temperature very low in. So that's where all the plants go over the winter time. So I always thought that was a great tip too. If you have an extra room that nobody sleeps in all the time, keep the temperature down low. It keeps the guests away too. So that's good too. <laughs> um, well, right now, maybe that's not a problem. So another one was if you have something outside like a hedicium, that's getting ready to flower and you've waited all year and now it's going to freeze. What do you do? Do you leave it in the ground and take the chance or do you pop it up right now? Again, <laughs> I've said it a lot, but it's going to depend on, on you really. If, if, if you can dig it up, bring it inside, maybe just put it in the garage overnight and, you know, a little space heater, whatever the case or, or, you know, just leave it out there and fingers crossed. But mm -hmm. yeah, trust me, I know how, how hard it is when, when uh, a cold snap comes because everyone's sending things back, back to us. Mm -hmm. and, um, but it, it's hard to give you a good answer. But if you can bring it in, that, that, you know, that's probably the safest, but it's going to depend on what you can and can't do. So how big it is, things like that. So. Do you have a resource, an education resource that would list a tropical plant with the temperature that it can withstand? Have you ever seen something like that? Well, there's a lot of good places. I okay. would trust more the EDUs and um, Missouri Botanic Garden is a great, that's probably one of the best resources if I just had to pick a random one um, is Missouri Botanic Garden. They have a great um, listing of all their plants that they have in their gardens and it will say minimum temperatures and thing like and things like that. Excellent. So that that's a, probably one of the better ones. Yeah, excellent. That's also where you can find out zones or you can go to the USDA uh, plant map with the zones on it. If you're going to determine the difference between San Jose, San Francisco and Ottawa, Canada uh, to be able to see what your zone is, uh, what you're doing. So another thing is this is this is a different one. I never thought about this. I know we do it in our coolers at the greenhouse, Smithsonian Gardens does. If you have something like a colocasia or a dahlia that you don't have a basement to keep cooler, would you put it in a refrigerator over the winter? Oh man. Uh, I would make sure I knew what the temperature of that refrigerator mm -hmm. was. I would assume mm -hmm. it's probably 35 to 40. I'm just guessing. I, I, I truly yeah. don't know the actual temperature of most refrigerators, but um, I've said it once, I'll say it a hundred times. It's going <laughs> to depend on the plant. Um, mm -hmm. Know what you have and what, what its hardiness is down to. Uh, I think that the easiest thing is just, just put it in a closet over the refrigerator, to be honest. Um, mm -hmm. I think it will be fine. Okay. So you have how many plants are you looking forward to receiving in the next month uh, that are going to be brought back to the greenhouse so people understand what numbers you're working with? Sure. So, yeah, a, a quick synopsis of what happens. Basically, um, about now, pending on temperature and things like that, everything that was on display around the museums and our various gardens will either get dug up if it was planted in the ground or if it was kept in a decorative pot, it'll be shipped back in the pot. And my job is to either repot it or keep it alive all winter. Then come spring, make sure it's perfect and send it back down again. But um, it, it's a, uh, a task to get some of these, you know, we have a gardenia that was pretty much a wide load hazard uh, that I cut back to like twigs this winter. And it really, it really is a team effort bringing things to and from the facility here in Suitland, which is about, I don't know, probably less than 10 miles from the mall, bringing them back and forth. But um, this year due to COVID, a lot of our items didn't get 
put on display, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But in some years, you get an early, early cold night, and it's like a mad dash. We're making trips back and forth, sending as much stuff as we can. You know, I literally just shove it in the greenhouse. As long as the door can close, that, that, <laughs> that's a win. So, um, but it's, it's, it's a challenge bringing things back and forth. So. Yeah. so I wanted to give you all hope when the next couple of weeks, when you're thinking about bringing in your tropicals, at least you don't have to do the numbers that Matt does. So I have confidence in you. Bring in the ones that you love, like Matt says. Don't worry about the ones that you don't love because next year is always a new year and you can buy more tropicals and put them in your garden. So I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Thank you, Matt, for being such a great uh, presenter. Uh, you're starting to sound like a lawyer at the end. Well, it all depends. <laughs> um, <laughs> Hopefully the sound depends. wasn't too bad, so. No, um, but thank you, and we'll see you again next week. Next week, we get to have our arborist join us, and he's going to talk about pruning, which is a, a very timely uh, subject to talk about, because people are thinking about what are they going to do over the winter uh, to re-enhance their shrubs and trees. So thank you for all. See you next week. Bye-bye. Thank you.